Anybody wakeboard for the first time yesterday? Anybody wakeboard? Anybody do something for the first time yesterday? What was it? Hold on. I'm going to sound really ignorant, but what is Gaga Ball? I saw the shirts. The new sport taking over the world? Does anybody not know what that is, or am I alone? Okay. Can somebody explain that to me, what Gaga Ball is? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right here. What is it? Really loud. Yeah. Huh? No, I just said really loud. Did I say Megan? Okay. So is it similar to dodgeball? So Gaga, does it have anything to do with the cultural phenomenon, or is that just they thought they'd make that up and no one would catch on that that? No, okay. Where where is this uh, Gaga ball court? Back there. Oh, gotcha. Okay, I'll need to head back there and try it out. Hey, so I'm going to tell you guys one of the scariest moments of my life. Is that an okay way to start off the morning? It was uh, in a kitchen at a kitchen table. Have you guys ever been at a kitchen table for a scary moment? I've read your parents like, hey, I need to talk to you about something. That's a scary moment, especially if you have fun planned that weekend because you're like, they could take that away. That's really scary. So one of the scariest moments of my life took place at a kitchen table in a home that belonged to my girlfriend's parents. Why, why the negative tone? My goodness. So I was driving home from college one day. I went to college in Canada, and I was driving home to Battleground, Washington. And on my way home, I stopped by my girlfriend's parents' house, and I was sitting at their kitchen table, one of the scariest moments of my life. I was like palm sweaty, heart beating, you know, uh, just, oh, it was so nerve-wracking. And I asked my girlfriend's dad if I could marry her. And he's like, yeah, that'd be okay. I was like, oh, my goodness. He's like, so how many years are you thinking? I was like, I was going to ask next week. But, uh, and it was a really scary moment. And here's the deal. I asked a question to begin a journey of getting to know my wife for the rest of my life. I didn't sit down at that kitchen table and say, I want you to tell me everything there is to know about this person so I can just know it and then we'll be done with this whole thing. But I asked the question, I want to start a lifelong journey with this person. And it was a terrifying moment uh, because just, it's just awkward asking someone to live with you for the rest of your life and be committed to you and live life and start a family. It's really, really scary. And, um, but the deal is, I wanted to get to know her for the rest of my life, and I knew it was going to be a journey, and I didn't ask her dad to tell me everything there is to know about her so that I could just move on to other things, but I wanted to start a journey. And we have a couple of really tough questions this morning that have to do with Christianity and God and belief, and how do we know that Jesus is real? How do we know that, that God is real? How do we know that Christianity is correct? And I just want to start off with the basis of we always have to think of our relationship with God and our relationship to Jesus in terms of a relationship. And sometimes when we sit back and say, well, I want to know every single thing about how that person works before I enter into a relationship with them, before I trust them. That's not how relationships work, typically. We get to know people over time, and the more years and years we spend with somebody in different seasons, we get to know them more and more. And for me as a follower of Jesus, as I've grown up and gone through hard seasons and good seasons, I've seen who Jesus is and who God is, and my faith grows. But sometimes we sit back with our arms crossed, and we're like, well, I want to know everything on the front end before I ever buy into this. And that's not really how relationships work. It's something that grows and takes time. So I just want to challenge you. If you're sitting here today and you feel like, ah, this Jesus we're talking about, this God we're talking about, like, I want to believe, but there's something holding me back. I just want to encourage you that for many of us, it is a journey. It's not something that we figure out in one day about who God is. And now we understand all the mysteries of God. We understand everything about Jesus. But it's a lifelong process. 
And this, this week, I encourage you just to take that first step to know Jesus more, to follow him, to see what he's really all, all about, to ask the question. So that's the foundation. I believe knowing God and knowing Jesus is primarily based on a relationship that takes time. And so we have three questions this morning that I think are really good questions, and I'm just going to give you my thoughts on this. And again, please take the time to keep asking these questions. Ask your youth pastors back home. Ask some of your other friends who are Christians, counselors. Um, we can have an ongoing conversation about these things. All right, so number one, the question is, what if Christianity is wrong and some other religion is right? Do you think we will still go to hell? And my first thought is that not every religion believes that there even is a hell. Um, the Bible teaches that if we reject Jesus, we will be cut off from God forever. And the result of being separated from God is hell. That's what the Bible talks about. So that's a Christian belief that to be with God is to be in heaven, and to be separated from God forever is to be in hell. So not every religion even teaches that there is a hell. But the thing about other religions is it seems really confusing. Like, why are there so many teachings about God, and how can there only be one true way? And my challenge to that is just because a lot of people say, hey, I think this is true, hey, I think this is true, hey, I think this is true, it doesn't mean that they're all right, and in fact, it's impossible for them to be all correct because they claim totally different things about the universe. But it also doesn't mean that Christianity is wrong just because somebody else says, hey, I have a different belief. And so my challenge to you as high school students is to look into what does that religion teach? What do they say about God? What do they say about life? What do they say about humanity? And do you believe that? Because oftentimes I think we look back and we're like, well, there's so many religions, I'm not even going to, it, it's all false. And when I started looking into the claims of what Jesus said, and I really started seeking it, I found answers. And there are other religions, and I've looked into them, and they have very different answers. And so God gives us a free will to choose what we want to believe. And Jesus talks about that in the Bible. But one of the most comforting things to me was hearing what Jesus' disciples had to say about Jesus' own claims as to who he was and what he taught. So I'm going to read a couple verses to you. Um, one of them is in the Gospel of John. We, we know about the life of Jesus. John was one of his disciples, and he recorded exactly what Jesus said so that we can read it now. And this is something that Jesus said when he was with his disciples, and this is John's account of that one of his disciples. Jesus said, the words I have spoken to you, he had just given them a very difficult teaching that was hard to understand. Sometimes we hear things that are difficult to understand about God and about Jesus. He says, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus is not surprised by our unbelief. There are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him? In John 6, uh, verse 65, he says, he went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. In verse 66, from this time, many of the disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Verse 67, Jesus says to his disciples, Do you, do you, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, and this is one of my favorite lines in this book. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And so for me as a follower of Jesus, sometimes I have a hard time believing some of the things that Jesus says. But my question is, to whom else will I turn what other belief system will I embrace that gives me the life that Jesus does? And I have found no other that comes close to what Jesus says and what he offers and the freedom that he gives. And I want to encourage you guys that sometimes you can have doubts. But like his disciples, to whom else are we going to go? Who promises eternal life? Who promises to die in our place, to take away all of our failures and give us new life? Who else claims that I am the only one who can get you into eternal life? I am the only one who can bring you back into a relationship with God who created you. Later in the book of John, in John chapter 14, in verse 5, 
It says, Thomas said to him, one of his followers, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? How do we know the way to heaven? How do we know the way beyond this life? One thing we do know for sure, people die. We're going to talk about it later this week, but people die. That is something that no one can deny. Life on this earth ends. So how do we know the way? Jesus had promised that he's the way to eternal life. Jesus said this in verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now that's a pretty bold claim. And so you guys have to make a choice when it talks about that question of what if Christianity is wrong. We have to write that off and say, this Jesus guy isn't really who he says he is. And he's just kind of making all this up because that's what he said. He said, no one comes to, fa- to the Father. No one comes to God except through who? Me. So Jesus is claiming that actually I am the way. I'm not, I'm not one way. I am the way. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus said, don't you, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And when we look to Jesus, we see who God is, the creator. And we talked about the Trinity a little bit the other day and how it blows our mind. But these are the words that Jesus has, and so he's the one who claims that I am the only way. So we're in this predicament where we either have to accept him or just deny him altogether. And then you have to choose somewhere else to land with your beliefs. And I challenge you to think what you believe, is that actually true? And that is a journey that I encourage you to take um, with your youth pastors back home. If you're not part of a church, I encourage you to find a church that teaches the Bible and ask questions. It's not an answer that we can just answer extremely quick. It is a lifelong process of coming to know Jesus more and more. But those are some of the words that he said to his followers when, he, when they doubted. And I hope those are encouraging to you when you go through times of doubt. The second one is very much like the first one. The question is, I don't believe that God is real. I don't believe that Jesus died for me. Can you prove me wrong? And sometimes when we have that posture and our arms closed and we're just like, well, prove it, prove it. Um, Jesus says, follow me. I'm going to start teaching you along the way. And oftentimes when we say, well, God, I want you to work on my terms, uh, we're, we're in a pretty dangerous place where we're not open to even seeking who God is. And I want to read to you a question is, I don't believe that God is real. I don't believe that Jesus died for me. Can you prove me wrong? And sometimes when we have that posture and our arms closed and we're just like, well, prove it, prove it. Um, Jesus says, follow me. I'm going to start teaching you along the way. And oftentimes when we say, well, God, I want you to work on my terms. Uh, we're, we're in a pretty dangerous place where we're not open to even seeking who God is. And I want to read to you another uh, passage, the words of Christ in Matthew 7, chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, open up to that. The book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 7. Anybody have really skinny pages in their Bible? I'm going to make a Bible that has very thick pages one day. Sticky, thick pages. Matthew chapter 7. This is what Jesus says. In response to someone with their arms folded saying, I'm going to sit here and God, you prove yourself to me. Jesus, you prove yourself to me. And if you don't, then I'm just going to sit here. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. And what Jesus wants to communicate to each of us is that this is a two-way street. A relationship is a two-way street. Where Jesus has shown us many things about himself through his word, through creation, looking around. The fact that we have air in our lungs. The fact that we have fingerprints. Um, God is all around us. And sometimes we, we don't want to seek. We want to sit back and say, God, I want you to meet me on my terms and prove yourself to me. And Jesus says, I, I want you to follow me. I want you to seek. I want you to start seeking after me. And I encourage you, if you have major doubts about God, about Jesus, just start seeking him. Start reading the Bible. I know so many people that they, they want nothing to do with God. They do not believe. 
and they don't want to seek answers in the Bible or even ask. But sometimes when we do read the Bible, we still have questions. And Jesus says, keep seeking. Keep talking to me. Keep praying. Keep coming after me. Seek me out. And that's how a relationship works. It's a two-way street. And so that's uh, one thing that Jesus says to us. And that's something that I've taken up to, to seek Jesus with my life. Not just sit back and wait for him to prove himself to me, but to follow him and to seek him in my life and seek answers in his word. And, and observe the world and see what's, what's working and how things pan out. I have many friends of other faiths. I have friends who are agnostics and atheists. And I have friends that are Christians. And for me, I have, life makes most sense in Christ. Uh, the answers that he give me, the answers that he gives me in his word, they give me life and hope, and I feel like I have a foundation to stand on. And a lot of the other uh, worldviews or systems of thought often leave me empty with more questions than when I started. And so I just encourage you, keep asking the tough questions about Jesus. Keep seeking him. Uh, he looks for those who are going to follow him, as we talked about. He invites each and every one of you to follow him. Many of his disciples, when they accepted the invite, they didn't know every single thing about Jesus. They were often confused. But he says, seek and you will find. And the last one is this, and this is a tough one. The question is, what if you weren't meant to be a Christian? Kind of that idea, does God create people who are never meant to be a Christian in the first place? And I believe the answer to that is no, but I believe it seems like some people weren't meant to be a Christian um, just a little further down in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus says this, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And he's referring to himself. I am the way to life. But unfortunately, if you look around, most people are headed down a road to destruction, a wide road. And I remember being in high school and, and really weighing, like, man, is this stuff that I know about Jesus true? Or it seems like the bulk of my friends are walking away from him. So how could he be true if everyone is walking away from him? And Jesus called it. He said, that's what's going to happen. Most people are going to seek their own way, and they're not going to follow me. Very few people will say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I believe what you are saying. And so I believe that everyone was meant to follow Jesus. The invite's open to everyone. He's not saying, no, this is only for a select few. But unfortunately, he knew many people would walk away from me, even though I'm offering them eternal life, even though I'm going to die on a cross to conquer death in their place, which I believe is the most radical truth that we could ever experience, and yet many of us are blind to that reality. And we live our life, and then someone dies, and there's something terribly wrong. And Jesus came to answer that question of what's next, why, why death? And he came to conquer death, and yet many of us ignore him and go our own way. And so most of my friends in high school were walking away from Jesus. Very few were walking toward him. And so I believe everyone is invited to be a Christian, but unfortunately not everyone will accept that invitation. So those were three pretty heavy questions this morning. And we're going to jump into our True Friendship series. But I want to take a moment and pray before we do that because I know that some of these questions can be really disturbing and frustrating and maybe we've wanted answers for a long time and we're not getting the answers that we want. So let's just go to God this morning. Father God, you are so beyond our comprehension. It's hard to believe that you spoke to us through prophets and, and that Jesus came into the world and that he's actually God. And some of the claims we're hearing in your word and maybe even during the session seem crazy. God, I ask through your Holy Spirit that you would open up our eyes to see the truth of who Jesus is and why we need him. God, it's so uncomfortable when, when we don't know, but I pray that you would just give us a trust in you that you created everything, you hold the world together, you know what's going on, even when we don't. So God, I just pray for anyone with doubts, that you would just give them the faith to take the next step, to seek you, to seek you out, to knock on that door and, and come after you, Jesus, and I pray that you would meet them where they're at, to show them your love, and that they would begin a relationship with you instead of feeling like they have to figure you all out. God, there's a lot of things about you we may never know, Help us to be okay with that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Any of you guys ever had a, a kid pool in your backyard? 
like a little kid pool that your siblings might pee in? All right, we're going to talk about kid pools in just a minute. I have no candy up here, but can anyone give me where we're at in the, uh, yes, right here. Oh, no, no. You're looking over. Look right here. Can you give me this? Okay, number one, true friendship invites. Number two, true friendship includes. All right, true friendship hears, and true friendship defends. You got it. Nice job. I owe you one. Come grab me later. All right, I'm going to talk about nasty pools, okay? My wife invited over a bunch of people, and I was having a busy week, and I did not listen to what was going on. True friendship hears I was not being a true friend to my wife. So I came home, and uh, she's like, hey, we're having friends over. I was like, oh. And she's like, and by the way, I told them that they could swim in our backyard pool. It's like two feet deep, little pool for Leah. They had some little kids coming over. I'm like, oh, great. So I go in the backyard, and I look in the pool, and it is green as a swamp. I'm like, oh, my goodness. They're going to think we're these, like, nasty swamp people that let our infant swim in a cesspool on the weekends. And so I was, like, freaking out. I'm getting bleach. I shook up the bleach can. It got all over my, like, sweetest outfit. And I'm like, dang it. And so I'm trying to bleach it. I'm trying to change it. But the water was so nasty. There's, like, nothing I can do. And by the grace of God, this family came over with no swimsuits. And I was like, oh, my goodness. That was a freebie. I was so worried that our nasty pool was going to make us look bad. But here's the deal about pools. If there's no water coming inside of it or out of it, and it just sits there, it can become really, really gross. And the water just gets so nasty that you don't want to get anywhere near it. Okay? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? You ever seen a gross pool? There's like bugs in it. Living creatures are evolving and coming out of it for the first time in history. It's gross. When it comes to water, we love purity. We love that word. Like, any of you guys love drinking pure drinking water? Like, people that make water filters use that word to market it. It's pure. It's good. How many of you guys want, like, hazy, okay drinking water? Some of you guys, come on, you drank Black Lake water yesterday. We love the word purity when it comes to things like water. But when it comes to youth pastors talking about our life, when I was in high school, the word purity was like, had some negative connotations. So I want to ask you guys, when you think of the word purity as applied to life, what kind of words come into your mind? The word purity, what do you think of immediately when I say we're going to talk about purity this morning? What do you think of? When I say you need to wake up, what do you think of? Purity, yeah. Okay, not having sex. Is that fair? If, if you're pure, that means that you're abstaining from being with somebody else physically. All right, what are some other words that come to your mind? What, what might be some words that non-Christians think of when we talk about it's important to be pure? What might, be, what might we think of? What was that? Okay. Do you have friends? I, okay, I used to get made fun of when I talked about the idea of purity. They're like, why in the world would you want to not have any fun in this life? And I think that sometimes when we hear that word, we think negative things instead of the positives as far as drinking water being pure. And the Bible talks a lot about our hearts being pure and that being really, really important. And I'm going to share a story with you about the purity of the heart and how that affects things, okay? I was in Mexico with a bunch of kids, and uh, we were sitting around these tables eating food, and one of our students was back at our youth group that was still happening. Some of us were in Mexico, some of us were at youth group, and he was texting a girl. And he's one of, like, my leaders. He plays guitar on our team. He's an awesome guy. We pray together. He's reaching out to kids at his school. And so he sends this girl a text that says, man, I'm so bummed that all the cool kids are down in Mexico. We're here with a bunch of kids at youth group. Some of the annoying, stupid ones I cannot stand. And uh, she, she had her phone open, and we were talking. And, like, I saw it. I saw the text message. And uh, I was like, oh, my goodness. I can't believe he said that. And I was like, hey, tell Mitch I said Hi. And so she texts back, hey, Luke says hi. And this text message comes in that says, please tell me he did not see that last text message. And uh, she's like, yeah, he did. And so he's, he's like backpedaling. He's like, I didn't mean stupid. I didn't mean annoying. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, they're wonderful people. I just, I don't know what I was thinking. I just had this moment. And, and all, he's just going on and on trying to backpedal. And here's the thing. Did he, did he mean that when he said that? Absolutely. 
But the minute he thought that his youth pastor heard it, he's trying to backpedal and change his behavior real quick and change his language and look super good. And so we went out to Taco Bell. You guys like Taco Bell? I find that a great place to be. I think it's a prerequisite to be a youth pastor. You have to like Taco Bell. I have to take medication to eat Taco Bell. Okay? So we're at Taco Bell, and I talked to him. I'm like, dude, you don't have to cover this up. Like, you really do think those people are annoying. So let's get to the issue. There's something in your heart. There's a way that you're viewing these kids at our youth group that, that is wrong. It's not pure. It's like my little nasty pool in the backyard. That's in your heart toward these people. And you really do feel that way. And unfortunately, in church, we're really good at knowing how to behave like we have pure heart and a pure motive towards someone. So we're really nice to people. But when our youth pastors aren't around, we say what's really on our heart. So we're actually able to talk about that person individual and pray that Jesus would give him a soft heart toward that person. But so often, we're really good at knowing how to act, but our heart doesn't reflect it at all. We really think someone's annoying deep down, but in front of everyone else, we're really nice to them. And, oh, hi, how you doing? But inside, our hearts are nasty, like a nasty pool. And so in the story we're talking about today in the book of Mark, we're going to look at what it really means to have a pure heart. And not just abstaining from things, not just doing good things or avoiding bad things, but what purity means in the sense of what Jesus talks about when he says purity. And we really do like pure things. We like it when people treat us with a pure heart. Any of you guys like friends who are really nice to you, but when you're gone, they text nasty things about you to other people? Do, do you like that? Okay. We love it when people have pure hearts as far as how it affects us. But often we, we've tainted that word with all kinds of images of boring or maybe out of date or maybe just someone who doesn't really know what's going on. And I want to see what Jesus really says about this word of purity this morning. So if you guys want to open up your Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. I'm not joking about that Bible with fat, sticky pages. I'm going to invent it. All right, so there were some people back in Jesus' day that believed that you could become impure by eating the wrong things, that if you ate certain things, it would make you impure. And like today, we believe that your heart can become contaminated by certain music that you listen to or behaviors that you do. And so we th say, if you avoid all these things, and if you do these good things, like being nice to your friends at youth group, even though deep inside you can't stand them, then you're pure. Jesus has a whole new definition of what purity means. And it challenged the people back then, and I really hope it challenges each of us this morning. In Mark 7, verse 14, again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Talking about food. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. Verse 17. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, then out of his body. And saying this, Jesus declared that all foods are clean. Verse 20, he went on. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. So with my buddy, the reality was his heart inside of him, he had impure feelings toward these people. He thought they were not as good as him. They were annoying. They were stupid. And that needed to be addressed. And so we actually prayed in that Taco Bell that Jesus would change his heart, give him pure thoughts toward these people. And so what this world needs, what Jesus is calling us to do is be the kind of friends who instead of challenging our friends to put on a face or act a certain way around a youth pastor or do things that we think will make us pure or avoid certain things, a true friend will, will ask for heart change. I have friends in my life that they, they point me toward Jesus and they challenge me to say, Jesus, there's something in my heart that is really nasty and I need you to forgive me of it and cleanse me of it and purify my heart. 
There's been times in my life where there's people I cannot stand. And I stop and I say, Jesus, purify my heart because there's all kinds of ugliness in the way that I feel toward this person, the way I'm about to treat them. Would you purify my heart so that what comes out of me is naturally good instead of me trying to put on a face? Have you ever been there? Have you ever tried to fake something, like fake loving somebody? It's really hard to do. Have you ever had a friend stay at your house a little bit too long? And you're like, oh, my goodness. I'm just going to avoid talking to them because inside my heart, it is nasty. I love my friends who challenge me to have a pure heart instead of just behaving differently. And so we're going to have our next item here, and that is true friendship purifies by asking Jesus to change their heart instead of just changing their behavior. And we talked a little bit about this last night when it comes to defending our friends by praying for healing. But are you the kind of friend who drives your friends toward Jesus and says, let's pray for heart change, guys. Let's stop. We're all feeling really bitter right now, and we're angry toward this person. Let's ask Jesus to change our hearts. That's the one thing I love about Jesus. He loves changing our hearts so that we're pure on the inside, so that we can really love people instead of fake it. And so that we can really love God instead of just trying to change our behavior. We do not do well at changing our behavior when we don't want to do it. When I hate doing dishes, I hate it. But now that I have my own dishes, I like a clean kitchen, so now I have a pure heart toward dishes. Me and dishes made up. We're all right now. It's much better living life by doing things that we love to do. And what Jesus loves to do is change our hearts so that we desire what he desires. And it makes life so much more natural You don't have to go around fake loving people. You actually start to love people different than you. And so a true friend, true friendship purifies. Have you ever had a friend that points you to Jesus, and when you're around them, your attitude changes? And have you ever had a friend that when you're around them, they almost bring you down? So we're going to look at three ways really quick that you can be the kind of friend who encourages purity by, number one, Like I said, pointing friends to Jesus instead of pulling them away. I had friends in youth group that when really important things were going on, they said, hey, let's listen up. I also had friends who when really important things were going on, like, hey, let's goof around. And they're always poking me in the side or joking around. Or when a really tough topic came up, they'd make a crack about it. And they distracted people from hearing about Jesus. And so we need to become the kind of friends that point our friends toward Jesus instead of pulling them away from Jesus. Does that make sense? And in that, does that make sense? Okay. One of them says, hey, let's seek Jesus on that. The other one says, hey, let me distract you. Let's go over here. Let's not talk about Jesus right now. All right. The second thing, a true friend encourages purity by making sure their own heart is being purified or changed by Jesus. We talked about this last night a little bit. It's really hard to look around at our friends and say, hey, you need to go seek Jesus in this because your heart is really ugly when our heart is equally ugly. So we have to make sure that we're constantly seeking Jesus and saying, change my heart because I don't like what I'm feeling right now. All these things are coming. I'm angry toward people. I'm short with people. I have a horrible attitude. Jesus, change my heart. And so if you're going to be the kind of friend who lifts your friend group up and points them to Jesus... We have to make sure that it's something that's happening in my own life first. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Coming to Black Lake was really hard because I knew that I had to get up in front of all you guys and tell you how to be true friends. When there were people in my life, I was not being a true friend too. And I was not believing that Jesus loved me that way. And so I had to get some things right before God. So I don't know where you're at or what is stirring in your heart that needs to be dealt with that may be causing you to just feel gross on the inside, and so you're trying to change your behavior instead of actually having your heart change. But if we we want to be true friends who encourage purity in our friend's life, a pure heart, we need to make sure our hearts are clean first. And the last thing is this. True friendship encourages purity by giving friends permission to be honest with them. It's really hard to point out something in our friend's life if they've never given us permission. And one of the best things that you guys can do, and I know it's awkward, is go to a friend and say, hey, is there anything in me that's really nasty that you see coming out in the way that I talk to people, in the way that I shoot nasty looks at people? Is there something that maybe we could get together and seek Jesus together and work on? Do you see anything in my life? I don't know if you have a friend like that, but I encourage you to find one. That's one of the best things you can do. Give someone permission. Say, hey, do you see something in me that's really nasty that 
I need, to, I need to be purified from. I need that out of my life, just like water needs algae gone from it to be good. Finding that friend can be difficult, but I encourage you guys to do that. Maybe think of somebody that you know who I, I think this could be a good friend that I could ask, hey, I give you permission to say, is there anything in my life that needs to change? I really believe if our hearts change, everything changes. And if we just try and change our behaviors while we're at camp, when we go home, we just fall back to the same people that we were. True change happens in the heart, not with just our behavior. And a true friend points people to Jesus so that their hearts can be purified instead of just trying to fake it by changing our behaviors. So I'm going to pray for us. We're going to head off to our cabins. Jesus, thank you for coming down here and desiring to change our hearts, not just tell us what to do or don't do. I pray that we would have a new mind as far as what the word purity means, that we wouldn't think of it as just abstaining from things and doing certain things, but we would see it as a brand new heart. And Jesus, that's what you desire to give us. God, I pray that if there's anything in our heart that's just nasty this morning and it's coming out in the way that we, cha- that with the way that we treat people, instead of just trying to white-knuckle it and change our behaviors, Jesus, I pray that you would change our hearts and we'd be the, the kind of friends who encourage that with the person next to us. Would you change our hearts? Would you purify us from the inside? Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think they're going to put the... uh